You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This week's episode is being recorded in New Hampshire. Hannah and I have been traveling and we're now up here visiting friends. And we're going to talk about some very interesting developments in New Hampshire. Just before I get into that, I want to just mention that my book, Job Free, is now available in paperback. So if you want to get a copy of the paperback version, you can now find it on Amazon. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our guests for this week's show, because I have two guests. As I mentioned, we've been traveling up here in New Hampshire. We had a great time on the coast, which was deep in snow. It's kind of a winter wonderland. And we're now visiting friends in another part of New Hampshire. And I have two guests today. And the first guest is someone who's been on the show before. And we've talked about Bitcoin and other things. It's my friend Stephanie Murphy, who also is a host of the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast. Hi, Stephanie. Hey, Jake. It's so great to be in the studio with you. And I just have to say, you're listening to The Voluntary Life, (laughs) where you can find ideas about freedom in an unfree world. (laughs) I totally messed that up. (laughs) You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. And now people are wondering, hey, wait a minute, if I skip back to the beginning of this podcast? (laughs) Yeah, so Stephanie is also the voice of my intro and a voice artist. And uh, yeah, how's that going, Stephanie? Oh, it's going awesome. Um, Speaking of job free, about three years ago, I quit working in science. I was uh, working as a scientist before this, and I transitioned to becoming a voice actor. And a lot of people said I was crazy, but I didn't think so. So I stuck with it. And now I am uh, doing great as a full-time voice actor. It's an awesome lifestyle business. I make audio books. I do commercials. I do video narrations. Um, I've got some, you know, pretty big jobs like national commercials. And all my work is 100% online. That's so cool. Yeah. So it really gives me a lot of Uh, just flexibility to work from home whenever I want. And I've even had a couple of other people, you know, comment, say to me, hey, I want to do this too. And so I've done a little bit of voiceover coaching to help some other people get started and they're doing great too. So I, uh, I really like voiceover as a lifestyle business and it's working out uh, great for me. So I'm glad I made that career change. That's great. And we're recording this in your studio, which is great. It's a really nice setup. And uh, it's nice to have the uh, monitors and be able to hear everything as we're recording too. So that's really cool. Mm-hmm. So and also, also I'd like to introduce our second guest on the show, Stephanie's partner, Brian Sovereign, who runs the Sovereign Tech Podcast. Hi, Brian. Hey, Jake. This is great uh, to be on the show. <laughs> I'm actually a, a big fan of The Voluntary Life. Uh, in fact, on Sovereign Tech, I even announced it as one of the, one of the best podcasts on the internet. So uh, this is a real honor for me. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I actually, I didn't know that you'd done that. So I, yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And Sovereign Tech is your podcast, by the way. Yeah, it's my podcast. It's all about science and technology and how they can help set you free. Uh, so I think there's a lot of cross-pollination between all of our work. Um, right. Certainly people looking to be entrepreneurial. Tech is uh, at the top of the list, I think, for a lot of people on that. Yeah, totally. And I will put links to all of these in the show notes as well. So people can uh, have a look at uh, Sovereign Tech and at Stephanie's uh, voice actor page. So um, what I wanted to talk about was uh, a subject that I think it'd be really interesting to get your thoughts on, both of you, uh, because you're both here in New Hampshire. And visiting New Hampshire uh, during this time has been kind of interesting because there's been a lot of news about the Free State Project and about something called Triggering the Move, which some people on who listen to my podcast may have heard of, but some people may know nothing about. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk to you about this, about the Free State Project. My, my audience is obviously interested in ways of finding more freedom, and the Free State Project is one interesting project. But before we get into it, can you just explain what is the Free State Project? Yeah, I think I'll take this one. Absolutely. The Free State Project is an idea to get 20,000 people to pledge to move to New Hampshire as long as 20,000 other people also pledge the same thing. And so they, you know, sign this statement of intent that says, yeah, I'll move to New Hampshire if a bunch of other libertarians also do. And then once you get there, the idea is to become um, active, to get more freedom, to be to be an activist for liberty, whatever that means to you. Right. So it could be more of a personal thing or it might be more of a political thing or it might just be like an intentional community. Exactly. And people do all of those types of activism in New Hampshire. And um, some people, 
it's been really interesting. We'll get into this later, but I've lived here for 10 years. I actually moved to New Hampshire early. I didn't want to wait for the Free State Project pledge to complete. So I moved here in 2006 and I've seen all different types of activism. And I myself have shifted from one type to the other (laughs) during that time. So it's written intentionally very vague. You know, the Free State Project is supposed to be a big tent and include any anyone from uh, complete voluntarists who don't believe that there should be any role for a state in a free society to minarchists who believe in sort of the minimal state, the night watchman or whatever, and um, everything in between. Right. And it does attract a wide variety of, of, of people. Mm. So you are actually a Free State Project signer. You you, pled, you signed that pledge back in 2003 or whenever it was? Correct. Yeah, I signed the pledge in 2003. At the time, I think there were not very many people signed up. Mm. The, the pledge started and was put on the internet in, I think, 2001. Um, and at the time, they hadn't even picked the location. It was just uh, an idea that came from this guy, Jason Sorens. Jason Sorens at the time was a grad student at Yale Mm. in political science, and he wrote like a paper, basically a thesis or something about, uh, well, there have been certain states within the United States, such as Vermont, where a lot of sort of liberal hippies have moved there and influenced the culture, and Utah, where a lot of Mormon people have moved there and influenced the culture. So what if there was a place where libertarians... Uh, gathered and congregated, and they made a concerted effort to influence the culture in that state. And um, he wrote about that and the potential impact that people could have just by moving to a place that was aligned with their values and moving Mm. there along with other people who had the same idea. And um, a lot of people really liked that plan. So uh, he put up a website or somebody put up a website and then they decided, well, New Hampshire would be a great place to do this because it's uh, low population. You know, it's not very populous. So people moving there could ha- potentially have a bigger More impact. Of an impact, right. And it's also very libertarian even before the Free State Project anybody got there. It's already got a libertarian leaning culture Um, and various other reasons like it's connected to, you know, it's connected to the coast. It has like a a beach. It's also connected to Canada. So like, for instance, way down the line of New Hampshire, like wants to break off and secede from the U.S., we would have like a seaport and (laughs) there's all kinds of considerations. People really went wild with thinking about it. Mm. But I think chose very wisely um, with New Hampshire. I think at the time, Back in 2002 or 2003, when they were trying to pick a state to go to, they asked various governors because they were thinking about like Wyoming, Montana, Alaska. They asked these governors like, hey, what would you think if a bunch of libertarians moved to your state? And the governor of New Hampshire at the time said, yeah, come on in. Right. And he was like the only one who said that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that may have had a sort of a, an influence on New Hampshire being chosen. So then once New Hampshire got picked, there was the phase of trying to gather enough signatures of people saying, yeah, I'll move to New Hampshire if 20,000 other people do so. But I didn't want to wait. I, mm. I had already wanted to move to New Hampshire. And for me personally, the cost was very low of doing that. I was a college student at the time and I was thinking about, okay, well, after I finish college, where do I go? And I lived in Massachusetts, which is the neighboring state of New Hampshire. It's just right to the south. So it wasn't a it wasn't like I would be moving a far distance from all of my friends and family that I already had. Um, and I wanted to move to New Hampshire anyway because it had uh, no state sales tax and no state income tax. Right. And in Massachusetts, they did have both of those taxes. And I just felt the presence of sort of a growing police state mm. <laughs> and uh, didn't like that. So it was very easy and low cost for me to move to New Hampshire. And I had planned on kind of doing it anyway. So signing the Free State Project was not a big deal. And moving early was was like what I wanted to do anyway. So right. that's how I ended up here. Right. So, yeah, so you were an early mover. And as far as I understand it, the idea of the Free State Project was that is then that these 20,000 people, that they're pledging that they will move once there is enough people who've all agreed to move. Exactly. But some people decided I'm going early anyway because I want to start this happening. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, were you also, uh, did you also sign the thing? And are you an early mover? I did. Um, Yeah, I moved in October 2011 uh, from New York. So kind of like Stephanie, it it wasn't like a a great cost. I mean, I drove three hours to get here. So no big deal. Um, But an interesting point is that on the Free State Project website, uh, freestateproject.org, they actually had a counter. Uh, They still have that counter. Mm. And as in like when you sign it, the counter would go up a tick. Right. So when I signed it, I was signer 966. Oh, right. Um, no, I think you were mover number 966. 
was I mover 966? Yeah. Okay, they have two so counters that, there. Right, there was a counters. signer's counter Glad and then there, there was a yeah. mover's counter. Okay. So I was a mover mover 966. I was worried if I was a signer because that meant that, <laughs> it's not that in, <laughs> inside of like four years or five years, we suddenly had, you know, 19,000 signers. That would have been strange, right? You might have been signer number like 14 or 15,000, somewhere in Most there. Most likely. Yeah. But yeah. you were mover number 900, which is interesting because that means that there were almost a thousand people who back in already moved who had already moved and had told the Free State Project that they moved because this yeah. is another aspect. Libertarians don't necessarily want to be on a list. So right. there's a, a number of people who just moved to New Hampshire and then they say, yeah, I'm not going to put my name on this list, but I'm going to move to New Hampshire and be a liberty activist. Right. So counting is a little bit of an issue, but go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. I didn't mean oh, to Oh, no. Interrupt. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just, I wanted to be in the first 1,000. I knew that, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I agreed. There's a lot of people that don't report that they, uh, you know, that they have moved. So that number, you know, how much meaning that has is, is up to debate, no doubt about it. But uh, yeah, definitely moved early and just wanted to, you know, get in on it. Mm. Uh, no doubt about it. And when you do move, you know, you really, you kind of, you go through a very interesting like mental process because suddenly once you're around, it took me a few months, but once I got here and I was driving around at the time I was living in Keene, which is one of the two hot spots in New Hampshire, Manchester and Keene. And I was just driving around town and I saw at least quite a few people that I knew. And I suddenly felt this comfort in that I knew no matter what, even though no, not everybody in New Hampshire, you know, free staters, as they're called, you know, agrees on everything, at least politically or ideologically. But one thing you can kind of count on is that they don't want to tax you. Right. And it, I just felt such a comfort looking around town, seeing, you know, and just knowing that, you know, these are people that actually don't want to steal from me. Right. You know, they, they don't want to tax me. And that, that that is peace of mind that is so tough to find anywhere on this planet. So that that was one of the comforts of being an early mover for me. Right. Now, of course, I should say, this is a project that is relevant for people who are US citizens, because you can really only go and move to New Hampshire if you've got residency in the States already. Right. And so this is relevant like for, for people within the US. And it's a special, and it's an interesting opportunity because the US has this federal system and there's different tax situations in each state. And there's also still, although it's kind of changed over the years, there's still quite a lot of decentralization of, of various laws yes. by state. So for US people, this is an opportunity, but it's obviously going to be harder if you're, if you're not based in the US to move here. I would say it's harder, but it might also be of interest to other people. I mean, it, obviously, it depends on what your situation is. But there was one guy from Russia, for example, who got political asylum and now lives in New Hampshire. Oh, right. Yeah. And there was also there's a number of Canadian people who have kind of moved to New Hampshire and gotten U.S. citizenship by marriage or just kind of stayed there. A number of immigrants who have, you know, by various means, just just kind of moved to New Hampshire. And that's the thing about the Free State Project pledge. Nobody's going to enforce it. Nobody's yeah. going to like come after you and check. And also nobody says you have to stay in New Hampshire. Like, what does it mean to move to a place? Do you have to stay for a month? Do you have to stay for a year, 10 years? Um, you know, it's kind of just... I think the pledge is meant to give it structure, but the real goal is to make New Hampshire a place where people who are libertarian minded want to live. Mm. And then they'll it'll be sort of irresistible for them. It'll be like a natural uh, fit for anybody who values liberty. Right. So in terms of how that's developed, we've just had this thing which is triggering the move. Right. right? So what, what does that mean? Uh, triggering the move is they finally reached 20,000 signers, uh, which has just happened in the past, you know, like the beginning of 2016. And that means now that all those people that signed are, uh, obviously like Stephanie said, you know, not really obligated, but now it's time. Okay. Get, you know, get your stuff in order. You've got five years, get to New Hampshire. And when they get here, they are to affect the culture in various ways. Unfo right. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, you know, in my own opinion, a lot of people want to get involved politically, but it, it happens. It's what they do. Uh, and, you know, or, or just at least be here and, and I guess support. I mean, that's always been the big thing for me is when these people get here, you know, you're just going to have this great community of people that understand exactly what you're talking about. And when you don't want to, and when you talk about liberty ideas, you know, they don't look at you like you, you have a pencil sticking out of your ear or something, you know what I mean? That, that's, and that's, that's great. I will say, and I think this is going to be a theme in our discussion. We don't look at at least I don't look at New Hampshire as some kind of a utopia or anything mm. where you have an, a community of instant friends. I think anytime you fall into that mode of thinking, that's kind of a trap. Sure. Because just like just because people listen to the same podcast as you or read the same books as you or 
agree with liberty ideas, so-called, it doesn't mean that you're going to be compatible friends. It doesn't mean that they're good people, even. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they're uh, sticking to everything they claim to espouse, like the non-aggression principle. But I will say that before I moved to New Hampshire, I had a lot of trouble finding friends who also were interested in libertarianism. Yeah. And now that I live in New Hampshire, it is no problem. <laughs> there is no shortage of people that you can meet that will at least have some common ground with you more than the average Joe. Yeah. And at least even if you're not interested in um, being active politically, at least you're going to find people who you can talk about personal freedom and the philosophy behind it. And you've also got the benefits of the better tax situation here, no income tax and sales tax and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And there's some laws, you know, I mean, and that's I agree, Jake, like you said, that a lot of it is really mainly meaningful to U.S. citizens. Um, but some of the like some of the little law differences in New Hampshire, I don't think people realize just how how big a difference they make compared to other states. One of the ones that I bring up often is you don't have to wear a seatbelt when you're driving here. And that's that's a big deal, because while wearing a seatbelt, when that was initially turned into a law through most states in the United States, that was a secondary offense, as in you could get ticketed for it if you were already pulled over for something else. But now in most states, it's a primary offense, which means if you're not wearing your seatbelt, you can, you know, you can get pulled over. They can pull you over to check if you're wearing your seatbelt, essentially. Right. And that's a big privacy violation. Exactly. So th there's one huge reason why the police cannot pull you over here. I mean, granted, yes, the police can really, they can get away with whatever they want, I think, many times. But, you know, there are a lot of these little, little laws, little differences that, that are here that, uh, that make it very attractive. The tax situation, the law, some of the law situations and all the rest. Right. Plus, right. it's just a nice place to live. It's you beautiful. Know? Yeah, it, <laughs> like there's mountains, there's a beach, there's all kinds of, there's lots of rural areas. And for me, I know you might disagree with this, Jake, because I know you think freedom can be found in the city. But for me, I really like a lot of space and rural mm. places and being in the woods is really synonymous with like kind of privacy and self-sufficiency and being left alone. So if you're that type of person, you can certainly find a place where you fit in in New Hampshire. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is beautiful uh forest landscape here we were driving yesterday and it was just miles and miles of forest and <laughs> beautiful uh, hills and small mountains and just just it is a lovely uh, natural environment here so if you're into that you, you know you certainly will find it in new hampshire i wanted to ask you two though like this is we've talked about this as a um as an idea but you've both had experience of the Free State Project. So what? how do you feel about it? What is your, what's your opinion of it? You know, having lived here for a while, what do you think about the whole project? Brian, you want to go first? Yeah, I could go first. Um, as far as, like, I definitely had a, you know, like Stephanie mentioned, the utopian ideals, you know. I, I, I certainly had some of that when I first moved. I thought, it's like, oh, this is going to be amazing. You know, everybody's just going to be, yeah, utopians in and of themselves. And that definitely didn't work out. In fact, I'll admit my first six months here, I was half tempted to move to Korea because <laughs> I was like, wait a second. I figured everybody here like read Mises and they read all this stuff, you know, and so I'd have these incredible intellectual, uh, uh, you know, conversations and everything. And that didn't exactly happen. Not to say it doesn't. It does. Uh, now that I've, you know, found people that are, you know, more in line with, uh, uh, you know, my goals and my uh, my vision for life. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that there, you know, you definitely got to keep that sort of thing in check. Uh, the Free State Project, like I didn't realize just how political it was going to be. I right. didn't really get that sense. Um, I understood that civil disobedience and things like this happen here. Uh, but even while that's certainly engaging with the political system to some degree, I didn't realize that people would just be running for office like rampant mm. and that people were into voting and all that. So while maybe earlier here we're kind of painting this, you know, incredible rosy picture, it's not the rosiest of pictures, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, and, and I, I'll admit real quick, I mean, just that, that I do have I, sometimes after being here for a little while, and this happens when you get here, if you're not ideologically like at a certain point, like when you get around people that are already libertarian, more or less, like mm. you start to develop mentally at, at, at like an exponential rate. Like uh, there's there's a saying that if you came if you come to New Hampshire as, you know, kind of a, a minarchist or a status, as they call it, somebody that, you know, is into politics and in voting and all that. A lot of times, six months later, you'll be an anarchist right. uh, just because you've been around this and you're allowed to like really develop without judgment uh, what's going on in your head and a lot of these ideas. Um, but I'll, I'll admit, I feel a little strange in that with the Free State Project, like if people... I guess a lot of the people around us, you know, outside of the free staters are 
status. I mean, a lot of them think very, very much in line with like in Massachusetts or wherever else. And I guess sometimes I feel like, who are we to move in and say they can't have their single payer health care? Right. Or something along those lines. Like, like, who are we to come in and influence things in such a way that they have to move? I mean, I, yeah, I, it, it's not a question that I have necessarily an answer for. But uh, but sometimes I do question the idea in and of itself, at least at the grand scale that it's at, you know, where it's taking over, you're not taking over, but as in influencing an entire state mm. with lots of people that just don't think that way, you know, that think the way that that with the ideals that the Free State Project is promoting. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's something that anybody who wants to live in a place that doesn't really exist on Earth has to grapple with, right? When they're trying to when they're trying to affect change in a geographic location or a state. I mean, I guess we could try to get off this planet or there's a lot of libertarians who tried to like build their own island, right? There was that island like Minerva or something that right. tried to build off the coast of Australia and it got invaded by Tongo and <laughs> you know, and that's the question, like what do we do? Um, or do we look at it as not trying to move somewhere and change the culture, but trying moving somewhere and then just trying to be as free as we can and living there um, mm-hmm. and doing our own thing? Yeah, I'm game for that. Yeah, that's kind of like the mindset shift that I've experienced as I've lived here. Uh, when I first moved to New Hampshire in 2006, I was up for doing political activism. I thought mm. I, at the time I was reading a lot of like Lou Rockwell and Mises and Murray Rothbard, who basically said, yeah, I mean, politics is a, is a total scam. It's rotten to the core. But yeah, you can, you know, you have to kind of participate in it anyway. You like, can get things done if you if you work at it type of thing. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I... Uh, I I kind of thought that at first, but I realized I was very naive in thinking that. I actually did sort of dip my toe into political activism. I went a couple of times to like testify at the state house for bills. And I just remember driving a couple of times in in a snowstorm because I I heard that this bill hearing was really important and it was going to influence something that was going to be a big law passed in New Hampshire. I think it was medical marijuana. And I drove to Concord in a snowstorm, which was like an hour drive for me. I took a day off of school. I was like in grad school at the time and none of the reps uh, showed up (laughs) because it was snowing. Right. (laughs) And so various experiences just like that or you know you you would work so hard on some kind of political campaign and then um it would end up that through some shady trick the bill would get like diluted and watered down and it would end up saying the opposite of what it said to begin with and when it actually got passed and and that's the kind of thing that always happens in politics and i got sick of that really quickly and I had sort of a, a moment where I was like, okay, well, now what? You know, I moved here to New Hampshire because I wanted to be a liberty activist, but I don't want to do politics. I don't think it's possible to make any meaningful change in the political system now that I've tried and totally, utterly <laughs> failed. And also, uh, I don't want to necessarily like get arrested either because there were, mm. that was like the dichotomy that I saw at the time. There were people who, there were, there were people who were kind of, uh, viewing activism as either or either you are working within the system and being respectable and sort of putting on a suit and doing this respectability politics thing and trying to get the government to be slightly smaller and taking begging your masters for freedom or you're doing this civil disobedience, civil disobedience and you're just you're doing the Malcolm X route and you're going outside the system and um, it was even compared which is I think really tactless for a bunch of white people to compare themselves to Martin Luther King and Malcolm X but that was like the comparison that was drawn where Martin Luther King was more working within the system and Malcolm X was like his counterpart outside or something. So I think there were people who were thinking of themselves that way. And I didn't want to get arrested. I, I, I never saw the real benefit of that. You know, mm. people would get a lot of, of attention from the community when they got arrested and put in jail, but nobody lasted in that. You know, you can only get arrested so many times before you get really burned out and sick of it. Nobody mm. wants to sit in a jail cell. Nobody wants to have legal troubles that prevent them from getting a job and follow them around. And I mean, you got to work, you got to make a living, you got stuff to do. You don't want to be just sitting and rotting in a cold jail cell, no matter how much attention you get from the community for it and praise. So I never wanted to do that. So I was like, well, shit, what do I do? Yeah. (laughs) 
So after a couple of years of thinking about that, I was like, well, I think I'll start a podcast. And I started my first podcast for fun. And it was like a liberty oriented relationship talk show called Pork Therapy. Yeah. Pork being a porcupine, which is like a liberty mascot. And started it with another free stater who was my friend. And, um, you know, we had a great time doing it. And over time... I realized that that podcast, my hobby, was uh, giving me more joy and fun than the work that I was doing at my job. And it took me a couple of years to realize that. But eventually I realized that this is what I actually want to do. I don't want to I don't want to continue in the job that I was working at. So um, I I made a, a career change. Mm. And uh, yeah, like through that whole process, I really shifted from thinking politics is okay, politics is a way to make change, to politics is completely useless. Let's focus on the personal stuff. Yeah, let's try on to finding freedom in your own life. Yeah, exactly. And I got really into uh, psychology and uh, personal development and um, location independence, like lifestyle businesses, kind of job freedom, finding freedom in relationships, and got really into the personal side of liberty. And that's where I am still pretty much at, where I think that we have the best chance of achieving freedom in our in our own lives. Even though I live in New Hampshire, and there's a lot of political people around. um, That's, that's what I'm thinking. I think you can kind of, if you want to focus on yourself and getting freedom within your own head, if you view freedom as an inside job, you can really do that anywhere. Yeah. Even though I'm sitting here in New Hampshire saying this where I live, I like living here. It's a nice place, but I don't think it's required to be free. Sure, sure. Well, that's really interesting to hear both of your perspectives on kind of the disillusionment with the political side of this project. But the other side of it is the social side that, Brian, you mentioned, you know, that it's a real opportunity to move somewhere where there are people who share a similar philosophical outlook and similar interests and some, and the same values and stuff. I want to ask you, because I think that you also mentioned that you had some expectations about moving here, that it was just going to be awesome, that you'd be around like-minded people yeah. and you'd all get on. And I remember it's like a, a friend of mine talked about his idea about going to university and he said that before he went to university he had this idea that it would be almost like you know like in the ancient world where people with togas were reading philosophy (laughs) and they would all be talking about their greatest like big ideas and philosophy and and they got to university and everyone was just getting drunk the whole time right and he was really disappointed with that experience because he thought by bringing people together who wanted to learn he would be in one kind of environment but actually it was very different I wanted to ask that's an astoundingly accurate <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you, what what is the experience like of coming together? Your expectations were, of, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to find a social life of people who share my philosophical outlook and my values. And how how did it work out? Uh, at first, it it kind of it you know it, it led to that disillusionment. It didn't work out very well. Um, yes, there was the comfort that I had in knowing at least there was some baseline stuff. Uh, that we all agreed upon, or at least you know, more or less agreed upon. Uh, that that was comforting, but it it really it took a while to to find people that actually you know are really. I mean, not that anybody has to be a hundred percent for you to want to socialize with them. You know, they don't have mm. to be in a hundred percent agreement with you. Um, but it, yeah, it just it took a really really long time. But when you do finally find those people, I mean, it is. There's a it's a, it's an incomparable feeling. Like I mean, there, there's there's nothing. You know, well, really well, you two right. found each other through the right. Yeah, questions. I mean, so. I was just about to talk about that, Brian. If you don't mind me sharing our first conversation, please go for it. Yeah. Brian and I were were uh, we happened to be at a a libertarian party house, basically like a, mm. a gathering spot. There's various social clubs that have sprung up over the years, and some of them are still around. That are basically libertarian. Uh, could you call them frat houses or something right. like yeah, that? They might as well be. They're they're libertarian hangouts, and mm-hmm. they have parties there. They have activities there. They have activism that people work on, projects and stuff. They're community centers essentially. Yeah. But this one in particular, it was a Saturday night, and they were having a party, and there were various people engaging in uh, certain activities that we don't partake in, like you know, drugs and alcohol and stuff. And so Brian's standing out on the porch, and we're talking to each other, and he goes, "Do you notice?" like no one reads <laughs> and and everyone's just smoking pot and I was like yeah I, I really feel that way too and then we started talking about all kinds of other stuff and that was our first sort of bonding mm. and so I mean it's true there is um there is sort of a drug culture you know in New Hampshire and I think we're not the only ones to notice it sure personally me and Brian we don't 
enjoy doing drugs or alcohol and mm. we just don't participate in that stuff. So at times it can be difficult to find people who share that um, that interest or that mindset. Yeah, it's it's really kind of led me to think that, you know, something like the Free State Project, the idea of an intentional community is a great idea. In fact, I think, you know, one of the taglines for the Free State Project is uh, liberty in our lifetime. Mm. Um, I don't know. I don't think the Free State Project itself is ever going to will reach it in my lifetime unless, you know, technology prevails and we end up living forever. Um, But I do think that you can get in your lifetime, you can get about 99 percent freedom if you take the idea of intentional communities and you bring them down to a much, much smaller scale. I mean, not 20,000 people, maybe 20 people, maybe even, you know, there's the the Dunbar number from uh, Dr. Robin Dunbar, Mm. which is the idea that you can only have meaningful relationships between five to 150 people. And that actually breaks down in a lot of different ways. It usually gets down to people that you can actually have an empathetic connection with is between five and 15. Right. It's like the inner circle. Exactly. Your inner circle. And so I think so I've kind of come to the conclusion that after being here and experiencing the social aspects of the Free State Project and all of that, that really the way to get genuine freedom in your lifetime is to it doesn't require you being in New Hampshire necessarily, though New Hampshire is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Um, it just requires finding, I think, maybe those five to 15 or maybe a little bit more, you know, however it works out, everybody's different. Um, and just kind of living together, you know, and, 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 and kind of kind of enclaving together. And uh, mm. that's that's really what what the conclusion for a lot of um, a lot of the social aspects you know, brought to my mind. The problem is it's so hard to do that in meat space, you know, like I would love to live near Jake and Hannah, you know, and have an intentional community of sorts where we could just be near our friends. But um, it's it's a challenge because there's like citizenships and there's mm. like, you know, visa issues and not everybody necessarily wants to live in the same place at the same time. And it, when when you get a group of people together who are all like libertarian minded, you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to organize a group dinner, let alone an intentional community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, a, a lot of people have said, though, in the Free State Project itself, that if there wasn't Facebook, there'd already be 50,000 people here. Because the the internet kind of allows you to create sort of virtual intentional communities. It allows you to think that, oh, it's okay, there's other like-minded people like me out there and I can communicate with them on a daily basis no matter where, where you are. Yeah, and I think you that can, can be I, a double edged sword. It though, can be. Because yeah. like at, at one in one sense it's comforting that you have right. like minded people that you can access anytime in virtual reality. But on the other hand, sometimes, you know, people wake up and they realize, Oh my god, all my friends are on Facebook, right? Mm. And I don't have anybody I can count on in real life. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. I think there is a, an, an alternative that, that I think, well, is really what Hannah and I are exploring to the Free State Project, which is to, to think of expatriating as a kind of Free State Project of our own. You know, and, yeah. and in a way, what we've chosen to do by choosing to um, spend our, uh, by getting rid of all our stuff and really living a, a lifestyle which allows us to do travel permanently although you know we don't travel all the time we, we we live in one place for at least six months and and we're going to explore different parts of the world in that way but it means that you know rather than trying to change the political situation in one area we are flexible enough that we can move if we don't like a place and we can try somewhere else and we can also benefit from you know for example as you know we we've we chose panama as our place to move to because of the various tax advantages of, of doing that and so I think there are alternatives, especially for people who are not based in the U.S., to think of expatriation as another kind of way of finding freedom in your liberty in your own lifetime, to right. use the phrase of the Free State Project. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no perfect place on earth for every libertarian, right? It's it's almost like you have to take an inventory of your own values and what's most important to you and try to find the places that have the most of that and the least of what you don't like. But also those places are constantly kind of changing. And if you get you know, if one thing becomes more important to you that you're not getting enough of where you live, well, then you can move. I really like that idea of um, of being a permanent traveler. Um, but yeah, I also have some, maybe this is my own personal issues, but um, I really like the stability of having yeah. lived in one place for 10 years. You want to be settled. Yeah, I, I really enjoy that. It makes me feel comfortable. And I'm not sure if that's if that's going to change for me, I, don't, I just don't know. I, I love what you're doing with your traveling and stuff. And I love what other people do with it. But for me, I think I really enjoy that stability and, and being settled and having like a, a home base, you know? Sure. 
Sure. So, but it's tough because there is no perfect place, right? Mm-hmm. So I have to accept the drawbacks of living in New Hampshire as well as the benefits. Yeah. The other thing that I really get from what you're both saying about the Free State Project is that if you look at a project like this as something that's just going to be there for you, that you're going to move to, and then it's going to be all these great people who are going to welcome you and give you a social life and give you, you know, a great community, then you're going to be severely disappointed. Whereas if you go there and see it as an opportunity that you have to define for yourself and find the people that you really get on with, then you can actually find, you know, a a lot of opportunity because that's kind of what you two have both done is you both got here got a bit disillusioned with what you thought you were going to find but then you managed to find each other and find ways of making the best and 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 meeting good friends amongst a lot of people even though you realize that some people who are here who may ostensibly share your values and you're not just not going to socially get on with that well yeah absolutely i mean we really we moved to a much smaller pond in the world that had uh, made it easier to find all the fish you know that you'd like to congregate right. with so yeah that that definitely occurred you're right I love the way you said that, Jake, and I think that's a great attitude to have about anything in life. It's what you make of it. You know, you, you have to create, if you want something, to a certain extent, you're always going to have to create it and, and make that possible for yourself. I'm not saying that in a woo-woo sense, like we have we create our own reality, but you have choice and you have the ability to control your own destiny. You're not just passively walking through life or moving through life you're able to um, influence what happens and you have control over your own life. Mm. And that's a really empowering message. So um, I think New Hampshire is definitely like that. And there there have been a lot of people who have showed up that I've observed in New Hampshire um, show up and, like you said, expect things to be handed to them on a plate. Mm. They expect um, to get a place to live. They expect maybe even people to give them money or free staters to give them a job. For example, oh, we get a lot of that. Yeah, um, they they expect people to support them with like you know babysitting, childcare. Um, there actually are, ironically, a lot of people who come into the free state community and essentially want handouts. They right. want to be taken care of, and that's kind of antithetical to the to the libertarian message. But there are people who do that with any kind of community. I think mm. if they see a community, they're like, "Oh, what resources can I get from that community?" Um, and they don't usually last very long. You know, they realize they're not going to get the free stuff that they're looking for and then they kind of move on um but then there are also a lot of people like us who you know maybe it takes us a year or so to find our friends and find where we fit in or maybe it takes more than a year or so maybe it takes several years but then we we eventually do and we get established and then we try to make the things that we're looking for happen (laughs) yeah I, I don't know what you think of this, but my experience also is that I've come through a kind of learning process that the, the philosophical ideas that I really that really resonate for me, when I find other people who share those ideas, I, I used to assume that we're going to have a great relationship because surely right. if we have this similar philosophical outlook, then, you know, it's, what, could go wrong? what could go wrong? And it's so it's become so clear to me that everyone has to some degree a disconnect between what they think their philosophy is in the abstract and how they actually treat each other and how they actually live so even if you are against aggression and you're for peace and these kinds of things you know if you behave really aggressively towards your friends then how are you really living your values <laughs> and and what i've found obviously i'm not this is not about the free state project but it's just in general is that when i meet people who share my philosophical values it, you have to see how people actually live on the day to day and on the the way that they treat their friends and the way that they uh, work in business and and how trustworthy they are and so forth because that's what actually matters right the philosophy is is the abstract bit ideally you want to find people who have integrity and who who whose philosophy and their personal behavior align but the personal behavior trumps the philosophy for me yeah yeah it's like do as i say not as i do right right if you're espousing a philosophy and then you don't live that Yeah, well, I think Ayn Rand had a great quote where she said, uh, success is no guarantee of virtue. And I think that's true of ideology as well. Ideology is no guarantee of virtue. Uh, Mm. You really got to have that personal level. uh, Like you're talking about, Jake, I agree with that. Yeah. Can we talk about the irony of the name of the Free State Project? Yeah, go for it. Um, Yeah, I think it it ties into something. So when you think about someone who's an anarchist or voluntarist and doesn't believe there should be a state, that there's no role for a state in a free society, and then you name something the Free State Project, isn't that kind of ironic? <laughs> <laughs> it's an oxymoron, yeah. I think it is ironic. 
I, I don't think that freedom can be really found through political means. I think probably the people who started the Free State Project um, were not were not of that mindset. I think they thought that, yeah, it politics is the way to achieve liberty. Mm. Um, and that's kind of con- connotated in the name. There have been people who have tried to say, well, it's, it means a free state of mind. But given the fact that it's about moving to the state of New Hampshire, I think that kind of falls apart like it is about creating a free state a political designation yeah when you read both of jason Sorens's books of course the founder of the free state project uh both of them are very heavily into political action uh and you know and and i want to raise another point quick and that is that he actually revised his numbers because we're talking about triggering the move to have twenty thousand people here let's say all twenty thousand people don't move his revised numbers said that actually only six thousand people would have to move to create the cultural and unfortunately political change um, that he kind of you know mapped out. So in uh, other words, he reckons that if you if you just get six thousand of those people, there'd be enough of a tipping point in terms of voting and these type of political things right. that it would really start 6, to change things. Six thousand that are as active as like the early movers to New Hampshire. Right, right. So that's kind of an important thing because sure. what we saw happen was funny enough before Jason Sorens even moved to New Hampshire, he moved like a couple years ago. I moved ten years ago, right. <laughs> <laughs> and there were a lot of other people who moved ten years ago or maybe before, and there were all already people who who lived in New Hampshire, so-called pre-staters, right. <laughs> instead of free-staters, who already lived here and were already libertarians and are saying, yeah, come on over, join the fun. So um, like those people who were willing to pick up and move to New Hampshire early, even before they knew if the Free State Project was ever going to reach its goal or succeed, they believed in it so much and they were such uh, they were so raring to go to do activism. They didn't want to wait maybe 10 years, 15 right. years for it to reach the goal. They just wanted to go now. Those people tend to be, I think, a little bit more active activists. Mm. And so if you had 6,000 of those type of people, then, yeah, you probably could accomplish the same as 20,000 people who are a little more like, meh, I don't really care that much. <laughs> well, and also you got to bear in mind that there's a lot of people who are like you two that, that uh, really understand the philosophy of liberty, and but you've chosen to just ignore politics and get yep. on with your own lives. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to be doing the voting and all of that because you you don't really take any interest in involvement in politics. You see freedom more as being about how you live your own life and what you do to get on with finding freedom in your life. As I and I share that outlook entirely. I'm I'm just not I just have I'm so cynical about the entire political endeavor that I have no interest in being involved in it at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I I mean, it's more than, you know, even a lack of taste. I mean, I think it's it's downright unethical. Like yeah. there's there's no you have no right to vote. Like no nobody gave that to you. Like where does that even come from? Uh and and engaging in the political system, the you know, the idea of telling somebody else what to do is so anathema, you, you know, to to what I understand of uh, you know, of liberty itself that, yeah, no way. Yeah. The only thing that you know for sure about the political process, um, any politician, whatever they say their platform is, there's one thing that you know about them and that is that they want to rule. Yeah. That's the only <laughs> yeah. thing you know because they're trying to get into office, right? Which ultimately is about ruling over others. Right. You have no idea whether they're going to do what they said they were going to do or whether they've been bought or whether or not they're going to change their mind or anything like that. The one thing you do know is they want to rule. And as you say, that in itself is unethical. So why right. would you want anything to do with it? Yeah, I love uh, how KRS1, he's a rapper, he, he really puts it really succinctly. He says, there's no such thing as government. There's just people ruling over other people. And that's that's all it is. No matter right. how you slice it, Democratic, Republican, whatever, it doesn't matter. That's how it is. Mm. And, you know, about the idea of mass migrations affecting political change, I don't think the hippies in Vermont or the Mormons in Utah, maybe the Mormons in Utah did a little bit, but they never had a concerted effort to get politically active, especially the hippies in Vermont. They just kind of moved there because they're like, yeah, I like this culture. It's like crunchy and liberal. (laughs) And I seem like I would fit in well there. And then they just kind of live their lives for the most part. I don't think many of them, if any, really got super involved in politics, but the change just happened as a result of the culture. And I think a lot of times political change 
follows cultural change. Mm. You know, the culture has to change first and then politics eventually, maybe really slowly, will catch up. Right. And that's certainly been the case with a lot of social changes to do with, for example, uh, civil rights, women's rights. There's been cultural change first that then got reflected in, in, politi- in politics. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a case that a lot of the political people in the Free State Project like to bring up is like, well, isn't it good that slavery was ended, uh, you know, in America due to the political process? And it's like, well, but that's not necessary. Uh, I I mean, Jake, you may know better than I in Europe, slavery ended because it was just a cultural shift. You know, they didn't need to put laws on the books. It just stopped because it was considered so terrible. Well, I think the way that the key thing is, is that what happened first is that it became generally accepted that slavery was immoral. Right. Then it changed politically. Right. But it was the fact that there were people who started actually accepting that slavery was immoral that forced the political change to happen. If people still thought it was just fine then the political change never would have taken place. So it's a cultural change first. Absolutely. And it only needs to be a cultural change. You know, there's no need to, to take it to the political level. I mean, that, that just becomes, I mean, if the culture is already ready, then there you go. Stop there. Well, uh, so, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just about to say, going towards the future or looking looking towards the future and what, what do we think is going to happen? Because I think that might be a good place to go. Mm. I, if nothing changed in New Hampshire from this point in time forward, as far as liberty, like if it never got more free... I would still be really glad that I lived here. I think it was totally worth it Mm. for me to move here in 2006 and spend the last 10 years here. And I'm so glad I did. I found the love of my life. I found a lot of great friends. I found a lot of cool community and projects. I changed. I I learned a lot about how to become free. And I I feel like I've liberated myself in a lot of different ways. Mm. And I'm super happy about that. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, If more freedom happens in New Hampshire as a result of the Free State Project, if a bunch of people move in the next five years and it gets even better, hooray, that's a bonus, you know, but I'm really happy I did it even without that bonus, even if nothing were to were to change. Yeah, same you, here. No, I, I agree with that completely. The, the other nice thing is, is that, you know, like Jake, as a, you know, as you're a perpetual traveler, uh, you, you get to kind of get out to the world. Uh, one of the I'll admit one of the nice things here about being here is that there are uh, various events that get held uh, that are, you know, libertarian events, and they're, they're some of the biggest in the world. Mm. And the nice thing is, is that the world kind of comes to you here. Right. <laughs> like, you're here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, all, all kinds of people uh, that, that you want to meet that are like-minded will actually come here, at least at some point, uh, it seems to happen. So, yeah, I guess there's kind of two ways you can go about it. You can either go out to the world, or if you're in the right place, the world can kind of come to you. Okay, well, I think that's really, really helpful and great to hear your reflections on it. Any last thoughts for people who are in the States especially, but people who are interested in the Free State Project? uh, What would you suggest, you know, what should they, uh, website should they look at and what should they think about if they're more interested in finding out more? Uh, freestateproject.org, of course, is the, the main website uh, to check out. There is a lot of people will tell you to go to Porkfest, which is the Porcupine Freedom Festival. Uh, and, and there's many people that consider that to be a microcosm uh, model of what a free society would look like and what it's like to actually live in New Hampshire. You end up with 1,200, 1,500 people will all show up in, in the summer uh, in New Hampshire and they get it's together. It's a camping festival. It's a camping festival, right. And, uh, you know, if you want to get a taste of perhaps of the free state project that's definitely the most uh you know for la- lack of a um, of a better phrase the boots on the ground way of doing it right yeah right i would recommend visit whether it's pork fest or whether you go to pork fest and stay an extra week and just bump you know drive around new hampshire and see what you like mm. um visit and see what it's like and meet some people and once you start making some friends they will fill you in on what's going on in the social scene and business opportunities perhaps um if you are considering like buying a house and getting settled in New Hampshire, I would say definitely rent a place for at least a year first and right. just get the lay of the land and see where you want to live before you make a big decision like buying a house. Mm. Um, the cost of living in New Hampshire in a lot of places is actually pretty cheap compared to uh, cities like Boston, New York, of course, um, and other places in the country. So, um Yeah. I mean, it can be a really nice place, especially if you work remotely or work on the Internet. There's a lot of people who do those kinds of jobs who are who love to live in New Hampshire because they can live in the beautiful snowy woods, not be bothered and still work and make a living on the Internet. Kind of like me. I could do it from anywhere. (laughs) The voiceover stuff. So, okay. anyway, I'm getting a little bit off track, but I would say if you're interested in the Free State Project, just visit and see what it's like. You can't really get a sense for it unless you actually come and see what it's like and just 
live here for a little bit. Absolutely. That's great advice. So thank you so much, you two, for sharing your thoughts about this. I want to make sure that people can find you as well. So um, tell, tell the listeners where to find you online. Yeah, so I'm a man of many hats. So the best place to find me is zog.ninja. That's the, that's the URL. And that, <laughs> the, everything I do is there. And believe me, there's a lot. Okay, great. Many hats, but no hair. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my voiceover website is smvoice.info. And you can find you know examples of my work there if you want to hire me for your audiobook or for your uh, video or your commercial, then you can get in touch with me through through that website, smvoice.info. Thanks so much for being on the show, guys. Yeah, our pleasure. Thanks, Jake. Glad you're here. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.